Okay, so I think we'll get started here. I think, let's see, I think we'll let everyone kind of come in still that, that's out there. Mike is a little loud, I think. So welcome to this session on intent and SDN-driven service chain. Um, I'm Kyle Mestri. I think anyone who was here earlier knows who I am. I'm the Neutron PTL and Chief Technologist of Open Source Networking, not NetWar, at HP. So go ahead, Dave. Yeah, you like that? It's like, we're all about Hi, mellow. I'm, uh, Dave Lenro, I'm from HP also, and uh, work in the uh, CTO's office in HP Networking. Yeah, hi, my name is Kathy Zhang. I'm a uh, um, principal engineer at Huawei USA. Um, I'm going to start first. So, um, so what is service training? Um, by service training, what we mean is that uh, through uh, 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 so we train management and control platform, different traffic flows can be uh, auto-provisioned to go through the different uh, sequences of service function, service function chains. For example, for tenant A's flow, it will go through a, a firewall, a, a NAT, a firewall, a IDS, a video, and a load balancer. For tenant B's flow, it will go through a NAT, a firewall, and load balancer. Even um, for the same tenant, different application flows can be um, steered through different sequences of service functions for um, different types of service function treatment. So now let's look at the, uh, what is service training from the data path um, perspective. So on the uh, OpenStack management plan plus SDN control plan together will automatically um, um, uh, a coordination of all the data plan components and uh, um, program those components to, uh, to, to steer different flows through different sequence of uh, service function paths. And those data path components include you know, the class file, uh, service function forwarder, which can run on virtual switch or physical switch, and then a bunch of uh, service function uh, um, um, devices that can be run on VM or on the physical device. So why do we need uh, service function training? Um, because service function training can be used in many scenarios. Um, one of the scenarios is it can be used in public cloud. For example, as this diagram shows, um, you know, like you know, one, ten, uh, one flow um, or video flow from one client, the, the look at the, 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 the pink path, will, be, uh, will, go, will need to go through a NAT and then firewall and then video optimizer and then load balancer to reach a video server. And then the, uh, the same clients, uh, your email flow might need to go through another uh, uh, service uh, uh, sequence uh, for the service treatment. For example, uh, you know, the red line sh shows the path. It will go through a NAT, a firewall, and then a mail security service and load balancer to reach the mail server. So for clients, another client's flow, which is a database access flow, it will go through a NAT, firewall, load balancer to reach a, a database server. Another use scenario of service training is in the hybrid cloud. You know, when the private cloud uh, does not have enough resource to, uh, to serve a tenant's uh, uh, request, it will leverage the resource in public cloud. And then there will be communication between the private cloud and public cloud. So for the data traffic from private cloud to the public cloud, it, those traffic will need to go through encryption. Um, and then um, for some other traffic besides going through encryption, they also need to go through a one optimizer and then a load balancer. And the other direction, when the data is shipped back to the uh, private cloud, it will need to go through a firewall, uh, IDS, intrusion detection service, uh, IPS, and sometimes it need to go through a cache. So that is saved in the cache, and then the next time the private cloud doesn't need to access public cloud, just access the cache. <laughs> Uh, another use scenario is uh, uh, GGSN, you know, uh, mobile wireless uh, uh, scenario. So either from uh, uh, iPhone, iPad, or uh, uh, laptop, when, you need, when the user needs to access the internet, it's the traffic usually goes through GGSN, PGW. And then from that, different types of traffic need to go through different uh, service chain paths. Like, you know, the, those green box shows a service uh, node. Um, for example, some of them could be parental control, and others could be like you know some security uh, uh, boxes. And so, um, 
what's the benefit of the new service training solution? Why we, we need it? Uh, we know that you know in existing uh, service training deployment, um, it's usually done through uh, manual configuration on all the uh, the boxes, and then that will requires uh, advanced business planning. Um, with a new solution, um, the 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 service training can be automatically um, provisioned. And also, the, we will provide a simple user interface for the user to specify the service chain requirement. It will be an intent-based uh, interface. So it will be a simple user interface. The user does not need to do manual configuration on, on all the boxes along the path. So that will lower the operational cost and also increase the agility of deploying a service chain. Um, so also another aspect is you know in existing uh, uh, solution when you want to change when the user change uh, a service change a service requirement or in or, or need to you know scale out and then you know those will usually requires reconfiguration of all the boxes. So in order to avoid that reconfigurations, which can happen for you know weeks, um, then you know we have to plan for the peak to allocate peak capacity. Um, but with a new solution, right? Because all the switching are automatically provisioned, and the data path components are automatically programmed to set up the service chain. So any change of the service chain requirement can be done in real time. So this will and lower the uh, capital expense because we do not need to plan for the peak capacity. And um, another uh, uh, benefit is uh, high performance. In existing solution, uh, you know, uh, the, the existing boxes um, are not all you know, application aware. So usually you know, we provision you know, all application flows belong to the same tenant to go through the same service chain paths. With a new solution, um, the service chain path is application aware. So different types of applications for the same tenant can be customized to go through different uh, sequences of service treatment. Now I'm going to hand over to Dave to talk about the intent. Yeah. So, you know, we've decided that we want to have uh, certain subscribers or tenants get certain services and they're described by something called a service chain, but it's, that still leaves the question of exactly how do we build that and how do we put it together. And I want to talk a little bit about what, what we mean when we talk about intent and then talk specifically about how this applies to service function chaining. And so essentially the spirit of, of the intent approach is to tell the network what you need rather than what we've done traditionally, which is tell the network how to do it. So in, historically, we sort of build a model of the network that we want, and we describe that to network equipment, and that results in supporting our applications. The intent-based approach isn't really about uh, describing the network. It's about describing the applications and modeling their behaviors and their interactions in a way that allows some smart piece of software that we might call an intent engine to do the translation from the what you want to the how do I do it with the, the current infrastructure. Um, and it turns out that uh, once you kind of define intent, it has some interesting properties that, that make it valuable for describing what we want out of networks. And the goal of a lot of the work that's being done across uh, several open source projects and standards development organizations and things um, is all designed to converge on sort of a universal language for intent so that all kinds of different applications can describe what it is they need from the network in a common language that can be implemented by multiple infrastructure controllers. So rather than having a kind of a traditional vendor interface to a vendor device and the resulting vendor lock, you end up with a common uh, agnostic interface that works across a, a variety of equipment. And in order to figure out sort of what is intent and what isn't intent, um, there's some kind of simple tests we can do and you know, the first has to do with the fact that the intent is invariant with respect to the state of the network. So if your high level intent is that Bob should be allowed to connect to the internet, that doesn't change because one of your servers went down or you changed protocols on a device or you bought a router from a different vendor or any of those kinds of implementation details. The, the piece that's the true intent and the piece that's truly portable and invariant is this description of Bob wants to connect to the internet and assumes you can somehow resolve what Bob is and, and what the internet is. 
Um, so that the portability point uh, is, is closely related. I, I won't belabor that, but uh, intent doesn't include any references to addresses, protocols, VLAN headers, media types, vendors, anything that's specific to the implementation. It's purely about how do the entities connected to the network communicate for, with each other and what do they need the network to do for them. Um, it turns out it's highly scalable because it's position and location independent. You can take the entire description of the intent for a network system and you can pass it to one giant mega controller or you can pass it to thousands of small, smaller domain controllers. The information that needs to be sent to those devices doesn't change at all and they can use their local context to figure out how to translate whatever the intent is to the specific rules and implementation details of, of the devices they control. And finally, intent brings context when you're looking at requests coming into a controller, asking for various things. Uh, if you go down to something low level like an open flow type of protocol and you try to figure out when things are contradicting each other and, and you know, aren't consistent, it's essentially impossible to do because you don't have any of the what are we trying to do context, you just have the what do the match and action table look like context. And so by working in the intent space where we're understanding higher level things, the internet, Bob, the secure servers and the finance department, that context can come into the automated resolution of that and help contribute to understanding whether ultimately whether the controller should say, yes, I'm gonna do all these things for you or, or no, I'm not gonna be able to. Um, so just some kind of simple examples and, and from everyday life, I think, you know, I want my headache to stop is intent. Give me two aspirin is prescription. There's lots of things that might help your headache. If you narrow it down and say the only thing I want is aspirin, you actually take off the table all kinds of wonderful opportunities for getting rid of your headache that have nothing to do with aspirin. And so the intent, that's kind of the idea, is let's give the automated infrastructure as much latitude as we possibly can to make decisions about how to fulfill the intent rather than assuming that the end user knows how to fulfill the intent and could possibly understand the state of all the equipment in the system. Uh, similarly, you know, when you want someone to cut your lawn, you ask them to cut your lawn. You don't give them a map of every blade of grass on your lawn and some specification for the length to cut it to. Uh, just kind of the high level what I want. That, that's what we're trying to get to. Um, and what we're doing with this across some different organizations is trying to create sort of a common interface that will be infrastructure agnostic and be uniformly implemented across a lot of things. And so in the ONF uh, northbound interface group, we're working on creating and approving at some level uh, pieces of the information model that would describe what this interface wants to look like. And then several projects downstream are gonna consume those software artifacts. In, in the case of the open daylight, it'll consume those as Yang models uh, in the case of some other infrastructure, it'll be translated to some other kind of format that, that's understood locally. And we'll end up with this single information model and sort of conceptually identical interface running in the Open Daylight NIC project, in the Onos controller project, in a OpenStack Neutron based implementation, which Kathy's gonna talk about in, in some detail as part of this presentation, and on whatever common infrastructure controllers emerge. The idea is to get kind of a network effect and get enough things working through this scheme across different pieces of infrastructure that it draws in more users and more applications and more use cases so we end up with kind of a, a common interface to, to collapse all of this. So when you talk about service function chaining and where's the prescription and where's the intent, it really comes down to uh, the forwarding graph description talks about the kinds of virtual functions in terms of their behaviors and what they do. It doesn't refer to specific instance of a virtual function. You know, if there are 10 virtual machines running uh, a firewall, the intent-based approach says, I want it to go through a firewall. The prescriptive approach says, I want to go through firewall number seven. And the problem that arises with this is it essentially becomes a, a question of where do you handle errors and faults and where do you do self-healing in this automated system and, and what's the appropriate layering and, and partitioning for that? And what I'm gonna suggest is that uh, when you have a low-level event like a network link going down, 
That doesn't change anything about the forwarding graph. If what you've said is the people in the sales group need to go through the auditing system before they can access the blah, blah, blah server, that doesn't change at all based on how many instances of, of that you have or, or those levels of detail. So what we're trying to do is capture pure intent, which is what are the things that need to go through this service chain and what kinds of virtual functions exist in the service chain. And then we hand that to a northbound interface that can then resolve the rest of the details. So that intent-based interface inside the controller in sort of a black box, that's where you're going to know about the fact that there's 10 different instances of that firewall and where you're going to get to make a decision based on some higher level logic. Maybe it's proximity to the subscriber's uh, point of attachment. Maybe it's based on the utilization of the links between the, the virtual functions, a number of things. But you allow the latitude for the controller to apply all the things it knows about the state of the network locally. And then if there's some fault, like a link goes down, the controller, without having to go back and have any interaction with the cloud management system or you know, the upper layers of, of OpenStack in this case, it can go ahead and pick a different instance, change the forwarding rules and the switches, fix the path so that the, the virtual function continues to work and you know, between saving the latency of going up to another control system and back and the complexity and the, the amount of logic involved, you end up with a, a much more seamless self-healing kind of a behavior and, and you end up restoring the customer's service much more quickly. So if you just look at kind of some common things that can happen in the network, if you have the prescriptive interface, you end up with a sequence where basically uh, Outside of the network controller, you try to harvest lots of information about the state of the network. Then you try to make decisions about which piece of the network to use. And then if something changes, you go back to the cloud management system, which has to try to pull all the state out of the network again and try to make the same decision over again. Uh, it, it causes lots of uh, distributed state problems that are hard to solve, and, and it causes a lot of overhead and errors. So here's just a simple table showing uh, kind of with the prescriptive approach there's a whole bunch of errors that can occur, all of which are going to cause you to go back through this long, painful cycle of having the orchestration system try to suck all the state out of the network and make sense out of it and then tell the network what to do. Where when you go to the intent-based solution, what you find is that the network controller can completely heal all of these kinds of faults locally without having to have any, any more interaction. We've really cleanly layered network-based faults and Decisions that require deep understanding of the state of the network stay inside the network controller and things that have to do with the high level business purpose and the interaction of the compute and storage and network, those, those stay in the, uh, the OpenStack domain. So for an intent driven service graph approach, uh, we still are working in the community to try to, to kind of pin down exactly what the info model is and, and what the syntax is going to look like. But the basic model is it's based on these ideas of groups. And so a, a system administrator or some piece of automation would start by building a database inside the infrastructure controller of endpoint groups that it knows about. And some of those endpoint groups would be specific to different kinds of end users who might be subscribers of, of virtual function services. Uh, the other kind of endpoint groups become the pools of uh, virtual function resources. So you might create a firewall type A endpoint group that maybe has some firewall appliance that's less secure than the firewall type B, which would be a separate endpoint group. But those become the pools of virtual functions that the network controller has at its disposal to try to satisfy the forwarding graph requests. Um, and then during the life of the system, you know, you can, as, as the orchestrator needs to scale out some virtual function, it's going to add a couple of instances of firewall type X, and what it's going to do corresponding to that is add them to that firewall group so that that's its way of letting the network controller know that there, it has a larger pool to work from and, and some new candidates to assign things to. So essentially where we're trying to get to is this single intent-based API that comes from a common source and a common definition that gets built on, on multiple systems. Uh, in the case of the Open Daylight NIC project, a service chain user would uh, you know, sort of speak the northbound interface to that SDN controller directly and would get intent-based service function uh, features through that mechanism. Um, in a system that didn't have a standalone SDN controller with that intent-based service chain API, uh, 
that would be sort of the right-hand diagram where actually the, the upper layers of that uh, intent engine would be implemented as extensions to the neutron system. And Kathy's going to talk in some detail uh, about a proposal for building those extensions into the neutron system and thus supporting the uh, intent-based service function chaining. Okay, so um, we know that in existing OpenStack, um, the core infrastructure, there's no support for service chaining. So in order to um, add the service chaining feature to the um, to OpenStack infrastructure, uh, one way is to exp uh, extend the Neutron API um, to support the service chain. So there will be a, a, a Neutron API extension to support service chain. And besides that, we also need a common service chain driver API um, for the different you know, um, drivers to hook up and um, to support the, to implement the service chain functionality. And on top of that, you know, we have this intent engine, uh, which will uh, you know, um, provide the user with an intent-based service chain API, which um, Dave already um, talked about. And then you know, that intent engine will translate the intent-based um, service chain API to Neutron uh, API uh, extension for service chain. And another part is um, that you know, um, um, currently OpenStack support uh, a few uh, service functions like firewall as a service, load balancer as a service, and VPN as a service. Um, but there are many types of service functions which are not currently supported by OpenStack. For example, like you know, IPS, IDS, and uh, uh, like you know, parental control. So those service functions will be created, uh, instantiated by third parties uh, service function manager. So how we can include those service functions into the chain? Uh, in order to include those, we have to provide a, a common API for third party service function manager to register their service function information so that you know, those service instances instantiated outside of the, you know, this infrastructure, OpenStack infrastructure can also be included as part of the uh, service chain um, path. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit more in detail about the Neutron API uh, extension for supporting service chain. So suppose uh, a user would like uh, a service chain from a traffic source to tr uh, this traffic destination to go through LB, firewall, and VPN. And before um, calling the Neutron API extension, the user is, uh, needs to first create those service function instances, create a firewall instance, load balancer instance, and the VPN instance, and also create the Neutron you know, network subnet, and then you know, associate those um, instances support with the Neutron network. So after that, and then the, you know, the user can specify the service chain uh, um, uh, specification at this Neutron API layer. So this layer is not the intent layer, it's a layer underneath. So there will be two paths of specification. One is a chain path, and the other is a chain classifier. So the chain path will, uh, I suppose here, um, the, the user has created the two LB instances, three firewall instance and two VPN instance. So the, the user needs to specify the neutron port for all these instances. And this information will be passed down to the control plan. So let the control plan you know, figure out you know, what exactly uh, service instance to use based on you know, network proximity, load status on the uh, service uh, function instance, and some other criteria. So besides specifying this uh, chain path, uh, we all, uh, the user also need to specify what kind of flow will need to go through this chain. So that's the chain classifier. So basically composed of you know, a source, uh, uh, n-tuple specific specification, the n and destination n-tuple specification. Here, this n-tuple could be an, any you know, um, descriptor. It could be, you know, you'll say, OK, a, a, a finance department is a source. Uh, it could be, say, you know, uh, the engineering department. So it's not necessarily, you know, those uh, network um, um, descriptors. So uh, we mentioned before that we also need to provide a common service chain driver API and so that, you know, um, different drivers, uh, so that we do not need to write, you know, a service chain driver for different types of drive, uh, 
a service chain API for different drivers. We can have we need to have a common service chain driver API that will be you know pass the information down to the driver layer, for example, to OVS driver, so that it can start implementing the uh, the service uh, the service chain path, the data path. So here is a um, common service chain driver API, and then you know it's very similar to the Neutron API, except that instead of the Neutron port information. Well, it will translate that neutral from that neutron port. It's going to get the uh, service function, uh, service functions locator information and other, you know, information associated with the service instance, and then pass it down to the uh, to the driver layer so that it can, you know, set up the uh, data path. Um, I will also um, talk a little bit more about the service function instant registration API. So what, as we uh, mentioned before, this is to use to, to integrate um, service function instance instantiated by uh, third party service function manager into the chain. So because the service instance information is outside of the OpenStack infrastructure, so in order to chain that in, we need to know um, what information, we need to know the information associated with that service instance. For example, we need to know all this type of information, like what kind of service instance type it is. Is it firewall? Is it a parental control? Is it IPS? Also, service instance flavor, even for the same firewall, it has different flavors. Uh, also, the locator information, the load status on that service um, instance, and also the service instance group for load distribution. For example, you can you know, create you know, five firewalls, and they are part of uh, one uh, uh, load balancing group, so that the control plan can automatically you know, uh, load balancing you know, um, between these uh, um, firewall clusters, and also decides which one is the best to use for, to serve that search chain um, uh, path. Also, um, it's like service instant chain correlation method. Basically, this need to be this information need to be collected and passed down to the data path so that the switch knows, you know, what kind of uh, chain uh, identification method the service function instance is using, so that it can, you know, um, communicate correctly with the service function instance. For example, if it's use VLAN to identify the chain, they need to communicate use VLAN. If they use uh, the IETF uh, new service chain header. They need to you know, know what kind of um, chain correlation method is supported by that service instance so that the switch can be properly programmed to communicate with that um, service instance device. Yeah, so here's the uh, information about this, um, this uh, service chain um, proposal. It's open for discussion. It's not like finalized. So everyone interested in this feature is welcome to, uh, to join the meeting discussion and then contribute and also post your comments, and give your uh, input and ideas. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you. I think that's all. You can take questions. Yes. Oh. Back a couple slides. Yeah, this one, the neutron thing, right? Nope. No, no, no. Yeah, here. Mm -hmm. Uh, not necessarily. It's, this neutron port can be identified, you know, can be associated with MAC address or IP address or VLAN ID plus uh, MAC address. It, okay. So I think here, the neutron port, uh, because currently neutron already have an entity uh, called neutron port, besides subnet network and neutron port, right? So this chain will be based on the neutron port and we assume the user has created a service function. And that service function has attached to the neutron network through that neutron port. But the ways to identify that neutron port could be um, uh, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, like a MAC address. It could be, you know, uh, any address that's uh, associated so with that. Um, 
This is not a class file. The class file is on the left side. This is to specify the service functions. You know, through, like for example, in this diagram, it's a green box. So what kind of uh, you know, uh, service function the traffic flow needs to go through? This is used for specify the service function. And uh, in terms of the traffic flow, it's on the left side. So how you specify the chain classifier, how you classify the flow. For example, you say on um, this engineering department flow need to go through. So that's on the left side, engineering department flow. Or you say uh, 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 like a finance department, or you say a group of people. Yeah, that will be specified on the left side. The right side, the chain pass is for the, the real service function instance chain. Okay. But I, I think maybe. But does LB1 have to be on a different port than LB2? Uh, different, yeah, different service functions instances will have different ports. Yeah. Do they have to? Uh, do they have to? You, you need to, to know. It, it can be a cluster, right? But then you, in order to reach that instance, you need to have a port, neutron port on the neutron layer, right? Because neutron layer, you have a network. And then you know that you have all the VMs attached to the network. Each VM will have its own port, right? If you have the same port, then you know in order to identify with the LB1 or LB2, you need to have a way to identify. That will be virtual interface. Another. So we need to extend that if that because you need to identify the instance. You cannot just uh, say send to all the firewall instance, which you know. You need to identify, you to pass that information down to the control plan so the control plan can figure out. Okay. Yeah, I think one of the things that creates confusion in this area is, you know, we could talk about layer seven or layer four through seven service function chaining. And what that means is that we use layers four through seven to classify the traffic and understand what source it's coming from. We then use, as you said, pure layer two traffic to steer it through the service functions, assuming they're layer two attached and, and they're referenced by MAC address. Similarly, if they were layer three attached and referenced, it would all be layer three forwarding. So we're doing layer seven forwarding with either layer two forwarding or layer three forwarding. It's a little confusing, but, but maybe that's where some of the confusion comes from. Okay. <laughs> Can you go to the microphone, please? I think we want to get it on uh, audio. Or we can, audio. Or we we can, can we'll your, repeat your question. We'll repeat your question. Or you can go to the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, the, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so my question is about the, um, the endpoint uh, groups, which you were talking about earlier on. So in, in this later part, we've been looking at what were classifiers, which were basically looking at the, 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 you know, the packet headers at different layers. And it seems to me that your endpoint groups are actually a much more useful abstraction than assuming we can grab that information out of anything that's in the packet itself. Because, you know, I mean, we may have duplication of MAC addresses, IP addresses, and all that kind of stuff. So it seems to me that, you know, I guess that's my question. How do you answer it? Yeah, so I, I think we're finding that the group abstraction is, is really important for getting to pure intent. So the intent is that the things in this group behave this way with respect to that group. The fact that there's these things called classifiers and layer three headers and layer seven, all that, that's implementation, which by definition is not intent. So we've sort of teased the two apart just so that you can have a pure intent API where you don't have to know anything about how you identify that endpoint. And then there's a separate service, which is the endpoint registry, or, or has a name similar to that, which is when you go to actually implement the individual policies, the way that the rendering engine, which is, is what we use to describe the thing that converts pure intent to the, to the switch rules, the rendering engine needs to know how to classify the endpoint, because that's the thing that's actually going to see the traffic at an edge, encapsulate it, and, and send it downstream. So we leave the, how do you identify that traffic out of the intent expression, the way you put the whole package together is the intent engine has to go to the endpoint registry, which will then say, here's the mask you use for your five tuple classifier or, or however that engine behind it is built. But, but yeah, I, I agree. I think we get completely distracted and we have highly variable information baked into all of our intent expressions if we don't tease them apart separately. And, and that's why it's designed that way. It's a good question. Yes.
interaction between intent and physical absorption? Well, so the notion is that the intent engine uh, has an interface where you ask it to do things, and it either says, yes, I'm going to do that because I know based on the state of the world that I can fulfill that, or it says, no, that's an error, sorry, can't help you. And then obviously there's the case where the network state changes uh, unexpectedly or asynchronously, and so there's, there's going to need to be a sort of a callback mechanism as well to say, I promised you I was going to give you X, but the world changed, and I'm letting you know that you know, you're no longer re receiving that service. Right, there was a, um, so is there anywhere in between, yes, I've done it, and no, I can't do it? Is, is, it, is, there, a, 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 is there like a side channel there with communication? Again, again, I think there, there's either a synchronous error returned or there's some kind of an asynchronous event that tells you that your promise was broken. But um, I, I think there's, in, in sort of pure promise theory, there's the idea that you don't need any of that overhead because the system will just perpetually try to fulfill the promise, which is fairly useless for building an SLA around. The fact that it was perpetually trying to give you your SLA values while dropping all your traffic really doesn't meet the, the needs of most, most operators. I'm going to ask you to repeat that once before I try to repeat it. I, I see. So really, this is a uh, data plane agnostic proposal and should support all of the different uh, encapsulated and unencapsulated schemes, uh, you know, which, which really deal with that issue. As long as the data plane bookends the encapsulation and you know, strips it off before it reaches the endpoint, you know, you'll get the original source and desk addresses undisturbed. Similarly, if some other non-tunneling scheme decides to overwrite them, you better put them back before it's done. But, but uh, all of that is sort of orthogonal to this, which is really just a control plane proposal and, and doesn't actually get involved in the details of how you build the, the data plane. Yeah. So I think we got one more question. Yes, Me? Please yeah. The Hi, thanks. Yeah. Um, so two questions. First is, this sounds a whole lot like an effort that's been underway for about a year called group-based policy. Could you please comment on how the two differ? That's the first question. Second question is, how are people actually going to deploy this? As I sat here listening to this, I was just withering under the complexity of what you were trying to describe, not to mention all the, st all the complexity that already is inherent in OpenStack networking. DVR, OVS, OVN, holy smokes, who is going to deploy this? This is crazy. <laughs> so the, the first question was, uh, how does group-based policy fit into this world, and, and where does it live in this space? And uh, I think the answer is, it is one of many different uh, intent-like projects that are being done in, in the world. And uh, one of the things that... Uh, we've been doing and, and I've been pushing through my role as the chairman of the Northbound Interface Group in, in ONF is to try to get all these projects to work together on a common intent interface in such a way that they can still bind their different implementations to the back end and compete over who can fulfill this API the best, but we get agreement and concurrence on what the API is and, and it's portable across all kinds of infrastructure. So currently in open daylight, uh, we're, we're finishing up building an instance of the uh, intent driven uh, service function chaining where we use the group-based policy implementation as the back-end implementation. Uh, we're also working on another version of it in the same project that would use the VTN back-end to implement the service chain, and we expect there to, to be several others. So group-based policy is, is certainly a part of this story and uh, fits into what we're talking about, uh, but may not be the, 
top layer API that, that most people see if they're looking for portability. Uh, in terms of how you deploy this, what we're expecting is there are going to be two camps that form. There's a camp that says, I use an SDN controller, which is a smart, standalone, autonomous black box that hides a lot of this complexity, so you never have to know anything about it. You just ask the SDN controller to hook up these magic service chains and, and life is good. The other camp is going to say, we don't believe in the SDN controller, or we can't, or we won't deploy that particular packaging, so we're going to do all this using the Neutron code that's part of OpenStack. And I don't have a good answer to how that's going to reduce the complexity on the OpenStack side. Uh, you're right, it, it's going to make, you know, a already complicated beast e even more so really before complex. we're done, uh, unless we can come up with some really clever abstractions to, to hide all of that. But uh, I've probably already shown my cards in terms of which camp I come from, but uh, <laughs> that SDN controller is going to be really easy. So, thank you. Yeah, just, just one look. So, so let's use the mic, guys. Um, so just one, one request. I think uh, after seeing this, it would be really good to see uh, a life of a packet or a life of a flow, a little bit more detail, as well as looking at some functionality with an NSH header capability to actually show off some real life events. So I, I think, think there's a lot of, lot of, comp there's a lot the of confusion here that, that was brought up. and such related to the Neutron proposal are going to be discussed in Neutron meeting next Wednesday and that that's probably a more appropriate format for the, the deep Friday, dive. Friday. Friday. But the, the Friday day in the life of the packet, probably better for that audience than, than this one. Yeah. I think we're right. a couple minutes over. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.